thank you everybody um, for attending this afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Christopher Warren, Managing Director at Accenture and Advisory Board Member for James Cook University in Singapore. I'd like to welcome you today to our um, uh, webinar on tracing the evolution of China's digital economy, past, present and future, uh, with Professor Alan Yi Leong Chong, who is joining us from uh, China. Uh, just to get going on administration items, uh, this webinar will be recorded um, and used publicly as an FYI. Uh, attendees are free to ask questions during uh, any point in the webinar through the Q&A function. Uh, so please ask, uh, the questions will be uh, answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, there'll also be a satisfaction poll or evaluation at the end. It'd be great if you could complete that at the uh, end of this uh, session. And if there are any technical issues, by all means, please um, place those issues into the chat window and we'll see if we can get them resolved as we go. So as I mentioned, um, Professor Allen is joining us today um, from China. He is the Professor in Information Systems and Dean of the Graduate School and Global Engagement at the University of Nottingham, uh, Ningbo, China. His work has appeared in multiple journals, uh, so many so that he was named as one of the most cited researchers in uh, China from 2015 to 2020. Um, and in 2020, Professor Chong was awarded the Ningbo uh, Camilla Award by the municipal government. Uh, he's co-editor of the Industrial Management Data Systems, senior editor of Decision Support Systems and associate editor of Information Management. So very honored to be uh, opening for uh, Professor Allen today. And uh, Professor Allen, over to you. I'm keen to learn uh, all about uh, China's digital economy. So um, take it away. All right, uh, thank you, Christopher, for your kind introduction. So uh, good afternoon, uh, greetings from uh, Ningbo, um, China. And of course, uh, thank you to uh, James Cook University, Singapore for, the, for inviting me to share some of the uh, digital uh, economy and happenings uh, in uh, China. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, I can share with the audience about the current uh, digital uh, economies uh, happening in uh, China, ranging from what happened in the past, present, and we also share about you know, some of the, the happenings in the near um, future. So my presentation will be roughly uh, broken into uh, three parts. So we're going to share about the uh, overview of uh, China's uh, e-commerce. And then we look at some of the unique business model and features of uh, China's uh, e-commerce. And uh, of course, lastly, we will look at some of the trends for uh, the Chinese uh, e-commerce. So I'm not sure how old uh, everyone is you know, uh, who are attending this uh, session. But uh, you know, we always talk about how fast uh, uh, development is uh, development is happening in um, in China. So if you look at uh, uh, the picture on the on the left, it's uh, actually Zhongguan Chun, which is uh, in Beijing. Uh, it's known as the China's uh, Silicon Valley in the nineties. So it's, it looks sort of like a, a a market, right? Sort of like the the market that we we expect. But if you move forward to today, it's actually a very modern um, high tech uh, area. So China's uh, e-commerce or the digital uh, economy has really moved, uh, has leaped from, you know, its humble beginning in the 90s and all the way to uh, uh, today. And this includes the number of uh, internet users uh, in China as well. So if you look at China compared to a lot of the countries in the West, they didn't really start off uh, uh, at the same level with, you know, let's say uh, in the US, for example, the number of uh, internet users were, were quite small, relatively speaking, compared to other countries. But uh, as you can see from uh, this uh, statistics, you know, it has um, grown a lot, you know, over the last uh, um, 10 years and so. So the number of internet users in China has basically tripled since, you know, the uh, early uh, um, uh, 2000s. And of course, in, in China, it's also quite uh, interesting compared to many um, countries where a lot of the users are mobile users. So this is quite similar in some, you know, in other countries, for example, like uh, in uh, Indonesia, for example, right, where a lot of users access to uh, Facebook, for example, social media via their uh, mobile um, device. But if you look at China, it's quite interesting because uh, a lot of the users basically 
they sort of skip right um, the the uh, PC era. So you know they they have mobile phone and then they use when once they have access to the internet, it's really via the um, via their mobile device. Whereas for me growing up, you know, I remember having a 386, 486 uh, uh, PC and then using a modem uh, uh, to connect to the internet and then slowly moving to laptop and so on. So a lot of Chinese users, they, their access to the internet are via their mobile device. And of course, uh, in terms of the penetration uh, rate for uh, uh, of the internet uh, users, in China is still lagging behind compared to countries like the United States, for example. But although in terms of percentage, you know, uh, the number of uh, uh, users over, uh, compared to their population is much lower, but the numbers, the actual numbers uh, in terms of uh, internet users is quite high. So when you look at some of the statistics uh, uh, shown in this uh, picture, so people who are going uh, online using uh, the internet and using mobile internet, uh, there are actually quite a significant number of uh, users in uh, in China. And of course, uh, one thing that China has done really well is in terms of uh, mobile payment. So, you know, more than uh, half of the users in China actually uh, make payment using uh, their mobile um, device, such as using Alipay or WeChat Pay. And uh, I must confess, I mean, uh, since COVID-19, I've been uh, staying in China for about one and one and a half year, close to one one and a half year. Uh, I'm from Malaysia, by the way. So, um, and I've not been carrying my wallet for more than one and a half year because simply you do not really use cash in uh, China. So, uh, you know, I carry a mobile phone, you know, to make payment. And at times in certain location in China, you don't even need to use your mobile phone. So it's mainly, you know, through uh, facial recognition where you make a uh, um, payment. So if you look at uh, China, right? So everyone is really using uh, the internet. So you have uh, the general people using, even elderly, right? They are, they are because it's easier for them to use a mobile phone and they access uh, the internet via their mobile device. So we really, you have uh, uh, you know older people and you know maybe even young kids. So like my my children, my you know my my daughter is uh, eight years old, but you know she's really good with using the internet. You know doing video editing on her iPad. And uh, she started, I think, like two years ago. So we have, you know, in China, everyone is really, uh, like many countries, right? They're exposed to uh, the, the technologies at a very young age. So uh, if you are into uh, history, right, you know that people talk about the four great inventions of uh, ancient China. So it's mainly uh, paper making, printing, gunpowder, and compass. But uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the four great, uh, the four modern great uh, inventions. So of course, uh, high-speed rail is considered a, a modern great invention in China. But then if you look at the other three, they are sort of related to the internet or they've been enabled by internet. So uh, which is Alipay, so uh, uh, online uh, or mobile payment is considered as a modern great invention followed by uh, um, the bike sharing. So bike sharing, one of the reasons why bike sharing takes off in uh, China is also because of uh, Alipay. So not only you can scan, you know, uh, the mob, you know, you, you can pay to rent uh, the bike, but more importantly, so after renting the bike, uh, a lot of people, you may read in many places, people uh, don't put their bike back in place or they steal the bike. But in China at times it's a bit hard to do because you actually have what they call a, a credit rating system. So you scan using your, your Alipay. And you know, if you, do, if you don't return your bike, you, you get a, a, some sort of a, a penalty, right? a negative score. And this has an impact on you later on. So uh, uh, people actually, and, and, and more importantly, Alipay is uh, tied into your real identity. Hence, uh, a lot of, you know, it facilitates a lot of new uh, business model or uh, that are available in China and uh, the um, bike sharing is one of them. And of course, because of uh, Alipay, online shopping nowadays, this is really common uh, in China. So besides not carrying a, a wallet for more than uh, a year and a half in, in China, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't think I've done any physical grocery shopping or maybe I've done once or twice over the last 10 months, right? Uh, mainly I do my grocery shopping uh, online. 
it sounds quite a, a very sad life, but uh, the reality is uh, it's, it's very convenient uh, over here in China. So if you look at everyday life in China, probably it may be the same in uh, Singapore or in where uh, in parts of uh, uh, other parts of uh, uh, the world where you are from. But in China, essentially, you know, internet is part of your everyday life. You wake up, most people that I know, the first thing that they do is they chat, they, they, they look at their, their WeChat or they look at what is called Toutiao, which is a, a, an app that pushes news to uh, the users, you know, based on uh, their preference. And when they go to work, uh, again, I keep using myself as an example, my, my driving uh, license, uh, Chinese driving license uh, expired, um, I think three years ago, and I've not renewed it because, or, or I'm still finding it, you know, I'm trying to find time to renew it is because, you know, I've been, it's so convenient to use a, a, a car hailing app, just like what you have uh, like Grab in Singapore. So in China, they use DD. So a lot of people go to work with, uh, travel to work, you know, uh, uh, using DD app. And once you're in your office, you know, breakfast, you use an app. Again, I think in Singapore, you use, uh, if not mistaken, uh, Panda delivery, you know. So here you use something called Erlema. And then when you're working in China, they use apps like um, Tencent Meeting or, or Ting Ting. So uh, Ting Ting is quite an, an interesting tool. So uh, you basically lock in to, you know, you clock in to work using this app and uh, just mobile device and through uh, your, your, the Wi-Fi that you connect to, they know whether you're physically in your workplace or you're just logging in from your home. And they have a lot of features where you do uh, group discussion, email, file sharing, and so on using this particular app. So it's very common nowadays for, for employees of company to be using this app because it's an all-in-one app, right? You can say that it's a, it's a, it's a word uh, uh, processor, spreadsheet, you know, uh, scheduling system, email, and so forth, all-in-one file. During break time, then a lot of people then will look at their social media um, tools. And of course, like I said, grocery shopping after work, you know, in, if you have heard, if you follow China's news, so Herma from uh, Alibaba is quite popular. You know, they have physical grocery shop, but at the same time, you can do ordering via uh, your mobile device. But having said that, it's beyond these apps that are presented, right? So in China, you know, you have options. So you have Besides uh, reading news from Tokyo, you have other competing apps. So not only TT, you have tons of other uh, uh, car hailing uh, apps that you can use. Likewise, you know, for entertainment, for grocery shopping, and, and so forth. So much so that uh, in China's uh, tech firm, right, the, the impact. So, so internet is becoming an important part of everyone's life. So people who work in tech firm, Obviously, it's quite busy, right? Coming up with new ideas, pushing new, uh, new technology. So in China, it's become quite common, right? That people uh, start to talk about things like 996. Not sure if you have heard this in, uh, in Singapore, but in China's tech, work, tech world, uh, 996 basically means you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and you work six days a week. So this is very common in, in the tech industry. And the most recent one that I heard, which is quite shocking to me, is 007. So basically, you work nonstop, right? Seven days a week from 12 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. And uh, this is the lifestyle of a lot of the younger generations who work in the tech industry. So as you can see, uh, when you talk about apps, right? I give an example, you know, a few examples of uh, food delivery, car hailing, and so on. But if you look at apps in, in China, such as when you do search, you know, you have Baidu in China and then you have Google in the in, in US, in Singapore. When you do shopping, you have eBay in, uh, in, in the US, Amazon in the US, and then you have Taobao, Alibaba, you know, Jingdong and so on, and a lot, right? You have YouTube and then you, you, Youku. So whatever you, you look at the whole uh, digital uh, uh, ecosystems in what we have in the US and the other parts of the world, somehow you find an equivalent Right, similar apps that exist in China as well. And that go across, right? Going from bike sharing, right? All the way to podcasts, online gaming, health, uh, job recruitment, and so on. Now that brings us to, you know, looking at the current unique business model uh, and the landscape of uh, China's uh, e-commerce. Because by looking at those apps that I've uh, just uh, shown you, 
some people may question, right? They say, well, what is so interesting about China's e-commerce? I mean, basically it's just a copycat of what you have in, uh, in the US. So in the older days, you know, this is mainly the perception, right? They said, well, Chinese uh, e-commerce is not very innovative. It's not very exciting because all they do is that they just copy what you have in other places. And given that a lot of uh, uh, software are not available in, in, uh, in China, for example, Facebook is not really available. YouTube is not available. And hence, this uh, make in China's uh, equivalent app, they were able to um, grow. So if you look at it, is it really a copycat model, right? We saw Baidu, Google, Alibaba, uh, eBay. But in reality, if you look at a lot of uh, China's uh, e-commerce uh, platform uh, or companies nowadays, it's no longer just a copycat imitation uh, uh, model, right? Maybe many years ago, this could be the case, you know, hence the picture I show, right? They used to have, uh, if you go to uh, uh, Guangzhou, you can get all this mini iPhone. Well, it's not really real iPhones, right? It's just a uh, imitate uh, uh, iPhone. But nowadays, right, when you look at uh, a lot of the apps, for example, like WeChat, WeChat started off perhaps having similar ideas with WhatsApp. But on the other hand, with the way it's you know, the current model of where um, WeChat is trying to become a super app, where it has a lot of mini programming to it. Uh, it has some unique features, you know, such as uh, uh, where you can use, instead of typing messages, you use a uh, voice record, which WhatsApp later on uh, apply a similar uh, uh, concept using the same idea. So WeChat in a way is an integration of WhatsApp, Tinder, PayPal, Slack, Facebook, and so on. So what you see is that a lot of this e-commerce company where in the beginning, they may take a, a, a core idea from the US, bring it to China, but it evolved to cater for the Chinese uh, 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 environment. Take, you know, Meituan, which is sort of similar to uh, 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 Groupon. And you know the idea of uh, the, you know, Groupon is really not, in a way, it's not a very innovative model, right? So it's just sort of like group discount, right? Uh, uh, when you get it, when you get enough uh, retailers to participate in in in, in the discount, uh, you, you can offer you know uh, online discount for users. So Meituan started with a similar idea in uh, China. In, in China, so they copied sort of copied the idea, but the difference is that the idea is copied by thousands of other people, right? Everyone is doing the same thing, so you have. Groupon equivalent, you know, but in China, there are like hundreds and thousands of them. Eventually, the one that survived is the one that really, you know, uh, compete in this uh, red ocean, keep ad adapting, you know, having different um, services, different features. And Meituan today is no longer just a group discount app. It's actually a service delivery app, you know, based on, you know, testing, trial and error and changing its own. Uh, uh, testing different business model. So you can see that a lot of uh, people are recognizing that, you know, China now is becoming a taxable superpower because it has gone from imitation, taking, you know, some ideas and then innovating, you know, uh, the core ideas that they, they took in, in the, uh, from the beginning. So, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, I've, sh I've shown some uh, example here. So for example, in, uh, in, in China, one thing that's quite unique is that they have a lot of uh, social um, shopping uh, uh, features, all of live streaming. So yes, uh, you know, uh, in, in other places, they're also live streaming, but in China it's quite uh, unique, right? The apps has a lot of uh, unique functions that make it sort of a bit different from what you see in a uh, traditional uh, or, or, or um, TV uh, uh, read, uh, t tele-sales or the live streaming apps that you get in other countries. So for example, uh, um, they, they have a lot of uh, uh, features that make it more interactive, right? And a lot of uh, features that non-Chinese user may feel that it's a bit, a lot, it's very, it's very noisy because it's a lot of words, a lot of features that's a bit distracting, but uh, it fits quite well to the uh, Chinese uh, context. Likewise, uh, we, WeChat, for example, we may, so if you ask people, hey, what is WhatsApp? And we tend to think of it as a as a uh, communication uh, tool, right? You use it to message each other and then send a, a message to to your colleagues or friends. But in China, if you look at the picture I've shared here, 
it's beyond just uh, uh, communication tools. It has a bank transfer uh, uh, feature. You can order a taxi. You can pay your, your uh, uh, fines. You know, you can do uh, a appointment with hospitals and so forth. So, uh, of course, uh, because of time, I'm not able to go really deep into some of these uh, apps. But I've given some uh, um, references, you know, uh, over here. Which, uh, if you're more, if you have interest, you can uh, check them out later on. So in China, not only uh, the Chinese uh, whole ecosystem is very different, the consumer demographic uh, and users ex expectations are quite unique as well. So, you know, 70% of the Chinese uh, internet users are under 30 or what they call uh, post-85. Uh, post uh, so I remember when I talked to uh, one of the uh, former COO of uh, Alibaba, sadly he told me that, you know, I am not their target uh, uh, user. So to me, he said, well, I'm basically I'm too old. To them, they only concede, you know, they only focus a lot on the post-85 uh, users, right? So people who are grown up with the internet, you know, people who use uh, QQ, you know, people who use uh, ICQ, they're accustomed to using uh, internet in everything that they do and, uh, and, and via mobile, right? If you tell them that, you know, you go online using a computer, a PC, they, they will be really confused, right? And, uh, and, you know, just to see how, how, how young you are, right? So for me, I would say, oh, okay, fine. My understanding is that then young people use WeChat and I use WeChat as well. And, my, and actually that's wrong. So young people nowadays, you know, those who are in their uh, you know, teenagers and in their early 20s in, in, in China, they use QQ rather than WeChat. And uh, the reason why is because uh, they noticed that a lot of their, their parents uh, or grandparents are using WeChat, so they move away from that. Sort of similar to me still using Facebook, whereas uh, my kids uh, use Instagram rather than Facebook, right? They, they do not want to be on the same platform uh, with me. So uh, this is very different, right? Very unique uh, uh, in China where a lot of focus are, uh, on the internet are the young users. And as I said, uh, mainly, you know, the, a lot of uh, the development apps, technologies are all based on uh, uh, mobile um, devices. So much so that, you know, if you go, this is a real picture, you go to a so-called like a hawker center, right, in, in, in Singapore, the attractive part is because they provide free Wi-Fi rather than because of, of the, uh, the, the food. And there are tons, right, different apps, and they keep coming up with very innovative uh, models of using uh, 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 e-commerce or what you can call mobile commerce. And this is something that we are familiar with, right? Scanning things on a QR code. So you scan on QR code and you can make payments, scan on QR code to, to follow a, a, a page, right? So in, in China, there's a lot of uh, uh, apps or what you will call a company's uh, uh, mini program that embedded within WeChat. So for example, Starbucks, right? If you want to get a lot of uh, news about Starbucks, become a member, uh, getting discount, making payment. What you do is you scan them on QR code using your WeChat, and then you link that to your, the mini app of uh, Starbucks into your WeChat uh, uh, software. So for consumer, right, as you can see uh, in, in China, so using QR code, maintaining relationship with the users is quite common. I'm not sure about, uh, so I've been, I'm away in, uh, from uh, Malaysia or Southeast Asia for more than, uh, I would say, uh, more than 10 years now. So, you know, I'm not, so it, I'm not sure like in, in so for example, uh, in, in Taiwan, when I went to Taiwan, people still exchange, you know, business card. Whereas in uh, China, basically you just add people on WeChat. So there's no clear boundary between your social media, WeChat, and your business. So, so you know, I, I go to uh, 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 the market, you know, I buy a vegetable from, from the, the vendor and he may just add your WeChat, right? So that in the future, there's a, a new uh, uh, product, they will contact you. So this is uh, it become quite common within uh, the Chinese uh, environment. So a few years back, uh, some of them came up with innovative ideas as well. I think this was done in South Korea. Uh, this company is called uh, Yihao Dian, but it's no longer available. So they actually let people do uh, shopping uh, in the subway station, uh, you get to see, so while you're waiting for a train, you get to see real pictures that are very similar to what you get to see in a, in a, in a grocery store, scan the QR code, make payment, and then the delivery will be sent to your home. 
So you go, you, while you're waiting, look at the product that you want, scan the QR code, make payment. If it's very efficient, but once you get home, you know, the things will be delivered to your doorstep. And uh, there are also other very interesting ways. So it's not just about businesses, right? This is a, a research uh, project I'm working with a government official in, uh, in, Hang, uh, in Zhejiang province. So what they do is that they are using mobile device, integrating with their backend system to do disaster management. So the big picture here uh, that you can see is actually for them to track, right? Uh, uh, um, disaster, flood, you know, uh, rainfall, water level. And basically what they do is that, uh, so in China it's quite huge. You have a lot of uh, small areas where people have no access to facilities. So, so if it, when it's flooding, really they, they really can't get out all day by the time they are getting ready to, to, uh, to uh, evacuate uh, uh, the place, it will be too late. So what they do is that uh, through the use of mobile device, these uh, people in the village can actually log in and check, right? what is uh, uh, the, the status. So if it's raining uh, heavily, they can actually check to see if, um, if their place consider red zone, you know, uh, green zone, orange zone and so forth. And they actually get messages that alert them to uh, evacuate from a uh, place. And at the same time, uh, they also send workers to go there and track them down via their location and help them to uh, uh, sort of escape from uh, the disaster uh, area. So mobile app is, uh, as I said, uh, mobile is definitely an uh, uh, important part of uh, Chinese users' everyday life, just like uh, in Singapore, in Malaysia, except I think it's, it's really, it's embedded even more, you know, from in their work and education and so on. So I'm not sure if any one of you can guess what is the uh, number one mobile app uh, in China. So some of you may guess uh, TikTok, you know, uh, Taobao and payment, but mm -hmm. At one time, so now this may not be true, but it keeps changing right all the time. But at one time, this is the most popular app in China, most downloaded app at one point in China. And, uh, as you can see, so if you look at the uh, most downloaded uh, Chinese, it's ranked number one, uh, uh, even higher than uh, TikTok and uh, the Little Red Book uh, in, in, uh, in China. It's actually called Xue Xi Qiangguo, right? I don't know if, how many of you have heard of Xue Xi Qiangguo. It's actually an app pushed by the, or developed by the Chinese government. So it's an e-government app that has all these social media features that I talk about. And uh, it was quite popular at one time. So it, the, the app is very interesting. It has all the uh, teachings and, uh, 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 and ideas from the president uh, uh, of China, President Xi Jinping. So all the news about his visiting, you know, his teaching, his lectures, his ideas are all within this app. And the app is able to make use of a lot of the social media features that we have. So for example, after you have assessed this news, at the end of the day, you can go, on, go and take a quiz to see if you understand the, the teachings of, uh, of President uh, C. And then you, you take a quiz and it will actually show who is ranked number one, number two, and number three within your social uh, uh, network. So this is all similar to uh, some apps, the fitness app that we have, right? So every day, you know, you run 10 km, your friend run 15 km. At the end, you'll do a ranking. Who, who is the, 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 um, the most active user? This is the same, right? And you actually integrated some interesting feature where you are not allowed to ask your friends to take the quiz for you because uh, he has a camera feature, right? So you can look at whether you are really looking at those content and you are the person taking uh, uh, some of these quizzes. So uh, it's very interesting uh, features. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, the, the backend integration of supply chain technologies is also very advanced. And hence, you know, a lot of these ideas, uh, China's e-commerce really work because they have very well integrated supply chain uh, system and China is a big country, right? So uh, this is an example from Jingdong where uh, they, have a, they invest a lot in uh, AI automation uh, delivery of uh, products to uh, users automatically or using drone, for example. And of course, uh, there's also a lot of different uh, uh, delivery companies in China. These are just example, right? So with different delivery companies, it's easier for people, even in, in located in so-called, in China, they call it uh, second tier cities or third tier cities, which are villages, for example. Even places that are, you know, uh, rural area, they can still go online purchase uh, uh, items from Taobao, for example, and they still can get their product delivered because there are just so many local 
uh, 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 delivery companies, right? And this is an example of them delivering products. And in within uh, some of these villages, they even set up a, a so-called Taobao village to help people to not only to buy, but to help villages to embark into e-commerce to sell their products to people in, in different parts of uh, China. And uh, many of you know about uh, uh, the biggest event in China is actually uh, November 11, right? So this is a single day and uh, a lot of transaction. The last November 11, actually China reached a $75 billion amount of uh, transaction in just that one day. I'm gonna move a bit fast because I think uh, because of time, right? So uh, you still, I'll send some of this slide to the audience if I don't speak uh, in detail for each of these particular um, slide. But uh, in China, most of us heard about the BAT. So people just keep thinking, okay, e-commerce in China is Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent. But now is it, nowadays it's moved beyond that. People talk about TMD, TMDX, right? T being Toudiao, which is the company, right? That uh, uh, that also uh, the same company that owns uh, uh, TikTok right? and then Meituan and DD. So it's very competitive within the China uh, e-commerce uh, environment. And these are some of the top Chinese uh, internet players. Some you may have heard of and some you may have not, right? Tencent, Alibaba, Ant Group, which didn't really have a lot of positive news over the last uh, few months, but uh, Meituan, ByteDance, uh, Pinduoduo, and so on. So we may be familiar with some of these company, Alibaba, Baidu and so on, but in reality in China, there's a lot of uh, big internet players that may not be uh, known to uh, a lot of people, but in, in, in China, you know, their software, you know, is very popular and they have a lot of uh, users. And just to demonstrate, you know, that, you know, uh, the model is very unique, as I said, People say, oh, it's a Taobao, a copycat of eBay, for example. Well, just to demonstrate how different it is. So if you look at Taobao, this is the design of Taobao in 2003. Didn't really work. And this is Taobao today. If you look at the whole interface of Taobao, at least when I first look at, you know, uh, when I used to shop online on Taobao, I didn't really like it. I mean, the whole interface is too, too messy for me, right? It's just too noisy. Just very difficult for me to navigate. But the thing is, in China, they like this design way more than the clean design that you used to get in like Google, right? For example, or uh, in, 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 on uh, eBay or in uh, Amazon. So the design uh, and the way that the system, I mean, the design of the system is already very different. And the features are different as well. And also the, the whole idea, right? So companies like eBay, you know, they, if you look at the CEO uh, 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 of eBay in the beginning, well, it says, I want to create a reliable and trustable eBay to attract mainstream, mainstream customers in China. That sounds very uh, uh, um, professional, right? This is mainly you know professional uh, statement. But in China, on the other hand, just like what Jack, Jack Ma would always say, right? Or the CEO of, uh, uh, of Taobao at that time. I have a dream, right? The dream is to make e-commerce localized to ground in China. So the whole business idea and vision of companies are already quite um, different. Now, of course, uh, they have different ways of uh, operating as well, right? In, in uh, Taobao, you really, from the beginning, you need to have real identity. It's connected to your bank account. Uh, there's a lot of feedback on not only the seller, but also the buyers. So, you know, Amazon, the users rate the product, but Amazon don't really rate the users, right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can communicate with the seller. Uh, it's free. That means uh, unlike... Uh, a lot of uh, website where they charge they they charge a middleman fee. Taobao is just uh, there's no surcharge, so they understand the local culture. And there's a lot of social elements in uh, in, in Chinese uh, e-commerce. So for example, they would have features like pick for me. You no, know, they have apps where you buy stuff, but your users don't make the decision, but they let people vote. They ask their friends to vote for them. What what should they buy? And uh, in WeChat, for example, right? They actually have a feature. It's called uh, in Chinese. It's called uh, how wu chen. How means how wu means good product. So what they will do is that they friends who buy products, you know, they they'll share it, or they'll have products, and it shows that how many of your friends have bought these uh, products. So it's a lot of social elements with embedded in their in their business model. And uh, as I said, it's not they try to appeal to users not just based on a uh, professionalism, right? So people always talk about Guan Xi in China. You want to build good relationship, you want to be friends you know, with your business partner, with, with your users. 
And the same concept is actually embedded within their e-commerce uh, uh, business model. So these are some of the mascots in a uh, Chinese e-commerce uh, company. You may recognize some of them. So the first one, of course, with the, we, it says Taobao, right? The, the lion on the other side is, uh, is Suning in, in China. And then uh, the, the cat, the dark cat is uh, Tianmao. Timor, and then the dog is uh, actually uh, uh, Jingdong. So, you know, they use very cartoon-like uh, features. And you compare with e-commerce com uh, uh, companies. So if you look at the, the logo, booking.com, Agoda. I mean, when I look at this, it looks quite professional, right? Yeah, all this looks really professional. But if you look at China, right? So Tunio, which is sort of equivalent to uh, booking.com, as I said, they like to they like to appeal, you know, very very cartoonish, you know, uh, a more personal uh, connection to the users. So the whole idea is already quite uh, uh, different. So I'm going to move on. So I, I know I speak quite quickly because of uh, uh, time. So in terms of uh, uh, the last part, I just want to share in terms of some of the trends I think. Uh, uh, that's happening in the next uh, few years for Chinese e-commerce. Some of them are already happening, but uh, I mean, it is, there's a gaining momentum right, in some of these uh, areas. And of course, a lot of this is also driven by uh, COVID-19. So uh, I know many of you have seen this uh, share on uh, social media posts, you know. So digital transformation, right? What really led to digital transformation? And obviously people always say this because of uh, COVID-19. The same actually is happening with the, my, my current uh, workplace. I mean, we are doing, we are investing a lot more on uh, uh, technologies for e-learning, for example, or blended learning. And the reason why is of course, because of uh, COVID-19. And if you look at Chinese uh, e-commerce, uh, because of COVID-19, it's really uh, has an impact on how people use the internet. So for example, uh, people spend more time online, uh, people uh, download more uh, apps and the number of users, especially uh, um, I would say uh, people who are 41 and uh, above start to use more uh, internet on their mobile device as well. And of course, uh, what do people, what is the change right now compared to let's say uh, a year ago. So people spend a lot more time purchasing food and uh, grocery uh, online. Right, and buying a lot of uh, personal hygiene product, uh, online household product and so on. So this is true for me at least personally. So uh, before that, every weekend, I would actually go to her mother, the physical store to uh, purchase, uh, do my, my grocery. But nowadays, uh, since uh, COVID-19, right, people do it, uh, buy their groceries on, online and we get used to it, right? So now every week, Every few days, we just buy groceries uh, online rather than visiting the physical grocery store. And as I mentioned uh, uh, in China, right, a lot of people start to use uh, ding, uh, uh, working app like Ding Ding, Ding Talk, uh, WeChat Work and Tencent Meeting. So uh, this is also, I mean, this one is quite obvious, right? So most of us are starting to work from home. And as a result, you download a lot of uh, apps that facilitate you to work from home. And other trends in terms of technology. So mainly, I think there are a few trends, right? Uh, for uh, uh, Chinese e-commerce, uh, will be in the area of uh, 5G, uh, big data, uh, AI, live streaming. As I say, it's quite unique in in China. Blockchain, and then what is currently the government is uh, talking about, which is something called a uh, dual circulation economy uh, in in China, which has an impact on uh, e-commerce. So uh, big data, of course, uh, we know that big data affects everyone. Netflix, right? You, you, you know, it recommends uh, your favorite show to you. But in China, it's quite unique in how uh, uh, big data has been uh, uh, affecting users. So uh, one of the most popular show in China uh, uh, is called uh, uh, The Story of Yangtze Palace. I must confess I've not watched it, but uh, my wife and her friends have all been watching it. This particular show, Right, the whole idea in terms of the, the storyline actually is, is based on uh, uh, big data analytics, right? They have IT, the company that, that uh, produces the show, they, they, they have a lot of data on shows that are popular, what makes them uh, uh, interesting to users. Based on this data, they produce the show. You would have heard a lot about uh, uh, news on how they try to get criminals who have been on the hideout for the last 10 years. And when they turn up for certain concerts, right? they will be caught within 10 minutes. It's because of the facial recognition systems in China, integration of big data and AI. 
And uh, in, in China, of course, uh, you also have a credit rating system. So uh, whatever you purchase on your uh, Alipay, uh, whether you make payment on time, uh, how frequently do you return your product and so on, you give you a credit rating score. And this big, this credit rating score, you know, generated by big data understanding of yourself has an impact on users. So for example, maybe uh, if I want to rent uh, an e a bike, uh, I may not need to pay a deposit if I have a very high credit rating score. Uh, usually I ask people to do a, a, a interactive session, but because of time, so you can look at this. So, so what they have done with uh, uh, big data, they can even predict your age. So think whether this is true or not. Among these emoticons, which, which are the ones that you frequently use? So reflect a bit, right? And they found that people who use the first one with a covering uh, smile, people who are born in the 70s, right? People who are born in the 80s tend to use the, the, the big smile, with green face, grinning uh, smile. Post 90, you like to use this with the, with the tears. People who are born in uh, 2000, you use this. If you like to use the thumb up sign, you're probably age 55 and above. So, uh, you know, companies have even use emoji to review your age. So that's big data. And of course, uh, AI, right? Uh, AI is getting very common nowadays. Uh, and especially now that we are moving into autonomous uh, artificial intelligence. So in, uh, in China, uh, they are investing a lot in a uh, driverless car. And there's a city called uh, Xiong'an in China, where eventually the whole city, right? Maybe uh, uh, the way they design the city is based on driverless uh, car. And it works because of the advancement in artificial intelligence and 5G technologies, right? Uh, this is uh, some, some a picture of me visiting a company in China called Sanovation. So uh, the, the founder is called uh, Li Kaifu. So he, he was the uh, former uh, president uh, or, or the CEO of uh, Google uh, China. But if you look at it, they use AI in a lot of things. So detecting emotions based on the gesture of a user. So not based on your face, but based on how you stand and how you walk, right? Uh, the second machine is quite popular, facial recognition, and then they charge you. So if you open the vending machine, take out drinks, it recognize who you are, deduct money automatically. And the last picture uh, is just for, for, uh, for shops where instead of um, taking your product and scanning, it just recognizes, right? You, you move your tray of uh, 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 bakery uh, stuff that you buy, and the AI is able to recognize each of these items, and they can charge to your, your, your payment. And of course, uh, AI, big data, plays an important role in, uh, in China during COVID-19. So we use, I guess the same, it's the same with uh, in Singapore. So in China, uh, basically, you are given, uh, you are given a, 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 an app to, to um, see whether you're allowed to move freely, right? Or whether you need to be quarantined. And the app will give different colors, right? Green, uh, red, and uh, uh, yellow. So how do they determine this? A lot of them is based on uh, the data that they get and also based on uh, uh, analysis of your data. So where have you been over the last 14, years, 14 days? Have you been in contact with someone, right? Who, uh, who found to have uh, COVID-19? Based on that, your app, the color of your app will change. Right, from green, uh, uh, red, and uh, uh, yellow. And of course, uh, in, in China, it's quite amazing. What they have done is uh, with big data, knowing your, your, your behavior, knowing you know, who you are, you can actually have a vending machine. So if this is the, the picture on the left is a normal vending machine. On the right is a vending machine for you to get a car, a Ford car to do a, do a test, uh, test drive. So how, why, are they, why are they confident that you can take this uh, Ford car from this vending machine and not drive away? Because they know that uh, with your credit rating, if you have a high credit rating, you are trustworthy. And hence, right, you can drive, uh, you're allowed to test drive this uh, Ford car via this vending machine, right? Yeah, I've seen a, a documentary where people go on blind dates based on credit rating score as well. So this is an impact on everyone's uh, daily life in China, so. I'll skip that. And uh, yeah, it has a big impact in their business model as well, right? Uh, so in, in uh, Alibaba, for example, they are talking about something called new retail. So uh, again, having better integration of online, offline data. Uh, so when you go to a, a, a grocery store like Herma, you will need to pay using their app. You can check product information using their app, right? So, you, so what they do is that they have a 360 degree view of the users. 
right? Not only they know physically what are you doing, what you're purchasing, but what are you checking on the mobile device and what you are purchasing on, you know, uh, uh, recording your, 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 your uh, uh, data from your, uh, from your Alipay, from your Taobao online, plus your physical store uh, that you visited. So really having, making use of all this uh, technology so they understand users much, much better. I'll skip this in the interest of uh, um, time and just to try to uh, move on to a few things. So 5G is also obviously one of the uh, key thing in uh, China, especially when they have a lot of 5G uh, uh, point in China. And also it's very cheap to get a, a 5G mobile phone would cost less than 1000 RMB. So, I mean, that's as extremely affordable to most users in, in, in China, right? And uh, a lot of users are willing to upgrade to um, 5G and uh, again, I, I, with the interest, interest of time, I will not go into detail of this, but really with uh, uh, 5G, you have a lot more v, uh, business model. VR shopping, you know, uh, obtaining a lot of products, you know, using uh, augmented reality, going to shopping malls, having consumer uh, trajectory within malls using the, this, uh, uh, your mobile device. But more importantly, I think, not just for business, right? But 5G actually played an important role during COVID-19. So for example, uh, uh, they use uh, a lot of uh, 5G based medical robots that are mobilized in one hospitals. When they built the hospital uh, uh, in Wuhan, they were actually, uh, the design uh, of the hospital were, were collaboration among different designers via, and, and they were able to communicate because of uh, 5G uh, 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 technology. And uh, so this is uh, one. And of course, uh, live streaming is quite important as well in, in uh, China. So you will say, well, live streaming is really no big deal. I mean, it's happening in a lot of places as well, esports and so on. But really, gaming, sports, entertainment is really only phase one of uh, live streaming. So in China, phase two, then they move into uh, shopping, e-commerce, selling everyday life. So uh, if you see this picture, if you are following China's uh, e-commerce, this guy, his name is called Lipstick uh, brother Ko Hongke in Chinese. So he's a famous guy because selling lipstick. So everyday product, cosmetic. But phase three is selling, you know, they, they move beyond just uh, uh, selling uh, uh, all these uh, daily products, right? They are, they are connecting with traditional uh, industry and the people who are selling these products are famous people. So selling properties online, for example. So if you look at this, these people, they are well-known people. So like Lei Jin, which is the founder of uh, Xiaomi, actually selling, right, uh, uh, mobile, his, his products on live streaming. Charles Zhang, founder of Sohu, uh, were there. So uh, if you don't know who is uh, Charles Zhang, uh, he actually, well, you may know him from, uh, you know, people talk about him dating uh, Taylor Swift, right? But look at this, these people, right? They are all impo uh, billionaires or multi-billionaires selling products online or selling properties uh, uh, online. So the, to me, this is quite uh, amazing. And of course, uh, moving forward, just the uh, last few um, slides. Uh, in China, of course, uh, technology that's growing is also blockchain. So of course, uh, blockchain, you know, there's a lot of hype about blockchain, mainly driven by uh, cryptocurrency. But when I talk about blockchain here, I'm not just referring to crypto cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but really the, the blockchain has a technology. So China, for example, has a... a you know, with, with uh, the president, uh, their, their president uh, backing, trying to be a world leader in blockchain, taking blockchain into part of their, their uh, national uh, policy. I don't have a lot of time to talk about blockchain specifically, but just to give you an example, right? This is a research uh, work that I've done with my, my uh, colleagues. So in China, they have actually implemented blockchain, for example, in, in, uh, uh, in the central bank in uh, Nanjing, for example, where, so usually for central bank and commercial bank, for the interbank uh, cash transfer, it's quite a tedious process, right? So commercial bank A need to physically trans, transport cash to the central bank. And then uh, uh, the other commercial bank then needs to come and collect the, the cash. Typically, typically, this is how a lot of our commercial bank and central bank works. But in, in Nanjing, for one of their central uh, bank branch, they have actually implemented the blockchain such that right commercial bank can do inter cash transfer between them without pass going through the the uh, central bank. So I'm showing this example is because even the government 
is so receptive towards uh, uh, blockchain technology in a very sensitive area, right? In an area where, you know, involving money, right? So uh, this is how, how much, uh, I mean, this is definitely the future of uh, blockchain in China, I mean, where a lot of government are going to uh, implement this into their business operations and into their strategies. Lastly, I just want to talk about uh, the dual circulation economy. So because of COVID-19, so China now is trying to have a lot of, uh, you know, they try to have strategy that spur China's uh, domestic uh, demand. So although they still want to have a uh, foreign investment and pro, uh, uh, ex uh, boosting production for export uh, and so forth, but they're also trying to have a lot of so-called what they call uh, uh, a boost to their own uh, uh, economy via their local uh, consumption and local demand. And this provides a lot of opportunities uh, in e-business, for example. So for example, for um, um, travel industry. So you know, a lot of people are, are traveling within China. As a result, a lot of uh, uh, apps, you know, uh, travel apps for booking uh, Airbnb equivalent type apps in China, all will have more opportunities, for example. So, uh, I mean, this is, again, I see a trend where because of China government's uh, policy, where they try to push a lot of uh, growth uh, and sustain, uh, sustain, sustainable uh, uh, development in technologies, there will be a lot of uh, opportunities for um, the local uh, tech firms, including Huawei, for example, right? Where they have a lot of uh, challenges with, uh, with uh, the US, for example, right? So a lot of investment will start to, a lot of R&D will be happening locally. So uh, I know time is up, uh, try to uh, speak uh, quickly, but I'm hopefully uh, with this uh, short period of time, I'm able to share, you know, some of the unique characteristics of uh, the Chinese uh, e-commerce uh, environment. I'll be happy to take some questions as well. So uh, Christopher, sorry, I overrun a bit uh, in terms of time. So. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. <laughs> to be honest, all the topics you were discussing were, you know, quite close to me. I think there's a, a Taobao package that arrives at my door every other day that my wife oh, orders fantastic. online here in Singapore. <laughs> so I, I, I was very interested when you were talking about the, the trends associated with, uh, you know, future virtual reality. I'd, I'd hate for my wife to get a hold of that. That's for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> No, but we do have a number of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we probably won't be able to get through all of them, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few of them, um, Professor, yeah. and, and um, a few people have voted these up and down. It, it looks like okay. we have a number of people that are interested in, in gaming. So yeah. the, the first question we have here is, you know, Tencent seems to have shown interest in gaming, you know, acquiring a lot of companies, um, Riot, Epic, should we be worried about uh, monopoly uh, associated with that similar to, to Disney? Yeah, so this is a good question and a very timely question, right? If you are following what is happening in uh, uh, China recently. So Tencent, of course, is very interesting, right? They are, in the past, they are known, they are, they are not known for being innovative. And when we talk about copycats, right? They are exactly the company that copy people's idea. And uh, they are quite aggressive in copying games the popular games they are overseas. Uh, QQ, right, which we, we know is a copycat of uh, ICQ. And when they were sued, they, they then bought out, bought out the company, right? Uh, so it is uh, not, so, so yes, uh, nowadays they, they, they are trying to uh, be a bit more innovative coming with their games or acquire a lot of our firms. But the monopoly part is quite interesting because um, Chinese government is starting to clamp down on a, a, a monopolistic behavior among Chinese uh, e-commerce company. So you may have read news that uh, Alibaba, for example, right? For the first time in years, they have actually made a loss in, in, their, uh, uh, their, in their annual uh, uh, report, right? Uh, because simply because they paid a huge fine. And one of the reasons why is because uh, of their monopolistic uh, behavior. So I think Chinese government now is tightening this up, right? They're trying to have a bit more control, ensuring that these uh, big giants, right? So uh, in a way, you know, you, you, you can be really powerful, you can be innovative, but uh, you can't be too <laughs> powerful in such a way that you become the monopoly. So I think they are, they are, they are, the, they are, the government is now uh, trying to have a bit more control. So I think uh, long-term you'll, you'll see that uh, this, 
this behavior was sort of be uh, so now. I mean, mm. Chinese, I, this is my observation. I don't know, maybe Christopher, right? Mm. As central, you guys do a lot of study into this. So you may be able to chip in. So usually they let you, first they let you do whatever you want, right? And you see that mm. in FinTech, right? Where uh, you have all these really creative ways, you know, like uh, online mutual fund, virtual credit card, become sort of like Wawa West. Before then they start stopping you, right? Coming with, you tightening up with the uh, regulation. So uh, I think this is what, what we'll see. Yeah. I think one of the other areas that, that's come up here and um, you know, beyond gaming is that you're, you're in, in China. And you know, one of the things being in Southeast Asia for me is hearing about what's going on within China. And, and there's a question from the audience here about, uh, you mentioned very early on the use of facial recognition to, to make payments and immediately you know, not even use your wallet, not even use your phone. <laughs> Do you have an actual example of of that that you could you know share with the audience where that's actually occurring and you're experiencing that? Yeah, I mean, what yeah. I just mentioned is uh, it's not a this it's not a fantasy, right? So in in uh, on campus, I saw Chris right online now. So I don't know when when Chris was a provost here at that time. Do we have this facility? But now on campus, right? We actually uh, the vending machine when you uh, try to get you know your diet coke uh, in the sports center. Basically, it's just based on facial recognition. So you go up there, it recognizes who you are, and uh, you just make you just deduct from your your Alipay, and uh, it's very common uh, nowadays. Yeah. So this is just an uh, an example of that, and uh, yeah. No, and, and it's, it's great to see that that's happening actually in the in the university and in higher education. I, I think there was a question around the the impact and change of innovation that's coming. Um, on uh, higher education, and you've given a, a perfect example there, which I, I think is great. Um, one of the next questions we, we have here, and, and this one I'm interested in hearing your perspective, um, Alan, is the um, is on cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, obviously you, you mentioned earlier uh, about uh, the government embracing that for interbank transfers um, for commercial banks. Uh, yet, yeah. you know. The Bitcoin portfolio is down 40% uh, in the last few days. So uh, there's a lot of um, speculation. Um, so from your view, um, how, how do you observe the adoption of that growing in China? And what's the trend in that beyond maybe, you know, banking uh, from your view? Yeah, so I think uh, cryptocurrency technically is not legal in, uh, in China, right? So, so like Bitcoin, for example, is uh, I think... It's, it's very hard to to take off uh, in China. I mean, legally, I don't think they are allowed to uh, invest in that because of the risk, right? That it uh, it poses. And I think you look at Chinese government; they are sort of uh, tightening tightening up uh, regulations, right, on on the fintech uh, industry, which is why you know you see this problem with uh, and finance trying to get uh, listing. But on the other hand, Chinese government uh, seems to have a keen interest in developing their own. Uh, cryptocurrency, you can say, or, or mobile wallet, right? Uh, I think they have launched this as well uh, in the beginning of the year in, uh, in China. So uh, to ensure that this, this uh, cryptocurrency or the mobile wallet from, uh, from the Chinese government is integrated with uh, Alipay and uh, WeChat payment as well. Mm -hmm. So certainly I think um, the Chinese uh, government is a bit more conservative in, 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 in the technology, right? Where they can't really control but on the other hand, uh, digital currency uh, is something that they have interest, but I think it will be within their, their control. So for example, I say they will launch their own uh, digital uh, currency uh, uh, and it's already happening. So that's, that's my view. I'm not really an expert in uh, cryptocurrency, so, but I'm, for, I'm pretty sure uh, the, the government is, uh, is trying to ensure, you know, uh, have, it's quite tight in controlling this now within China. No, uh, I don't think it's it, cryptocurrency is so new. Anybody that claims to be an expert, I uh, uh, question sometimes. You've got to do a lot of research in this to, <laughs> to know where it's going. So uh, we, we have a question now that's come through um, from uh, Carolyn Wong. Um, this question is, um, you know, firstly, thank you for your insights on e-commerce, um, she mentions. As users are mainly in under 30 years of age, um, do you see a change in the way people work in China? 
you know, from a collectivist uh, cultural approach to a more individualistic approach. Uh, and do you, how do you see those characteristics in behavior changing based on the, the technology that you see coming out now and the use of that technology? Oh, this is a good question. It's a tough question. I mean, uh, I mean, in general, I think it's still a very collective, uh, collective is uh, culture, right? Even for young people, although they are, they are very, uh, 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 more than they are very independent in their thinking, at least based on my observation of uh, younger people that I interact with at the uh, university. Um, I mean, at the moment, if you look at a lot of the, uh, the apps, the popular apps that are available, it still it may not really be a collectivist uh, culture that that's playing a role, but social. But certainly, it's because of the the um, social features that it has. So, if you look at uh, a popular app in China, I don't know whether people in Singapore heard about that. It's called Ping Duo. Ping Duo Duo means uh, so Ping Duo Duo actually is a threat to uh, Taobao in China. So it's a concern to uh, Alibaba, where people can get very cheap discount, sort of like a group purchase. Right, uh, so you get a lot of your your friends or people that you know, and then you 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 uh, uh, group purchase of a certain product, right? Yeah, sort of like group one by some mobile device, mm -hmm. but so it's not really collectivist culture, but certainly you try to uh, make use of your social network, right? Uh, the people that you know, so it's still uh, happening. Uh, definitely, uh, a lot of uh, the the apps are targeting to young people, especially young successful female. So one of the app that's quite popular in China uh, is called uh, Little Red Book, Xiao Hongsu. So Xiao Hongsu is something like you would say it's an integration of uh, it's an integration of uh, Instagram, Facebook, and eBay. I'm I'm, I'm not hundred percent accurate, but uh, mm -hmm. no. So so it's a it's a but this app actually uh so it's a social media app, a lifestyle app. You'll say that really is popular among young successful female, right? Professional uh, uh female. Because you get to see people who are traveling, buying nice, luxurious uh, products, for example. So I think there are users that are a lot more, um, they have more spending power. Uh, they can make their decisions. Uh, they are not so, so in the past, you know, they may, a lot of users may be, so they, they, may, they may be following trends, right? Oh, I'm, I'm into this brand, foreign brand and so on. But now you can see that uh, that may not be the case anymore. So they are able to make a lot more uh, independent decisions in, in that sense. Yeah, I hope I've answered that question. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, my, my view it, that is it's it's giving people the, uh, the, the channel to engage more broadly, yeah. Um, yeah. even though that's individual, but culturally everything is very much still collective is what I yes. got from your answer. Yes. So, um, Another uh, question coming through here on um, the the population growth um, in, in China, and you, you definitely showed some great examples of the different types of apps being developed in China versus you know the ones you see in more Western economies. When you see the success of the digital transformation in China, do you see this as being replicatable in you know other emerging economies, whether it be ASEAN or, or others? Um, in, in terms of exporting some of those ideas? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think, uh, you know, some of the uh, apps that we see, right? Like, uh, in, in, you know, like if you talk about Grab, right? You talk about uh, some of the way they design. It's actually, they follow a very similar path, right? That what uh, companies like Alibaba does, right? So you have, initially you have a simple app and then they try to make it a super app having payment for delivery and all, all, all in one. So I think a lot of the innovative uh, business model that's taking place in uh, China, it sort of sort of works, right? In, in Southeast Asia, and they're sort of copying the, the model, right? Yeah. Oh, grab, grab looks very similar to some uh, some of the screens you shared today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, in, 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 you know, like uh, in, in Indonesia, right? Some of the apps, right, they say that Tokopedia and all, it's all, all having some of similar idea, right? And you see a lot of merging, right? Between all these large uh, internet uh, companies, which is similar to what is happening here in, uh, in, in China as well. So you have all these comp competing apps, right? And then eventually then they uh, merge, become a really big player. And I mean, just recently, the same thing happens in, in Indonesia, right? So, so it's quite similar in that sense. Uh, I think one thing that facilitates the growth of uh, uh, internet in China is also 
the, the users, right? The number of uh, users that have access to the internet, 3G, 4G, cheap mobile device, that helps uh, payment. Alipay plays an important role in facilitating a lot of these uh, different business model. Right? Although, of course, I, 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 when I, whenever I go back to Malaysia, you know, my friend will say that, wow, you know, mobile payment is also take, taking off. But somehow it's just still not as common uh, 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 in China. So some of this, to, to, first, to enable a lot of this business model, you, on, on, you know, mobile apps, you really need to have a mobile payment. So, uh, and maybe in, in, in this kind, uh, like in Malaysia, Singapore, other Asian country, maybe government need to play a more active role in pushing, you know, to, to drive uh, mobile payment. And then you'll see a lot of all this uh, uh, business model or, or apps that will take place. So that actually follows up with, a, with an interesting question here on, you know, and not sure if you know the answer to this is, um, do you know if the, the government in China used Alipay to support the contact tracing efforts for, you know, COVID uh, and, and the pandemic? Uh, I think the technology firms help out uh, with the government. So I'm just using, just speaking from my personal uh, experience, right? So the, the apps, the COVID uh, tracing app that we use uh, is actually embedded within uh, uh, WeChat and uh, Alipay. So, you know, I have options to use different apps. So this is one way where it's easy for pe easy, easier for people to uh, use these uh, applications. So, uh, and I think it ties to your, your data, your, your so-called uh, real identity on Alipay as well. So when I use Alipay, I'm trying to go to Guangzhou, for example. So I need to switch my location, right, from Ningbo to Guangzhou. And they have to make sure that it's me. You know? So uh, with Alipay, I've already, I've already done a, a real uh, authentication. So I, you know, Ali has my face, right? I mentioned that they, they can have facial recognition. It links to my passport. I've taken a picture of me holding my passport for them to verify it. Me mm. and so, so 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 they use all this data. Yeah. That's your you're you're verified with Alipay. Therefore, you you if you go via Alipay, you're verified in other areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm conscious of of time, and we do have a number of, of questions that we we probably won't be able to get to, but we'll we'll try and get uh, one more um, out um, for now. Uh, this question uh, is. Uh, China, this is uh, from Denise um, uh, on the on the on the chat on the webinar. Is China working towards um, you know fraud challenges in a different way from other countries based on the technology and, and innovation that you see? You know, so is is there any new and innovative uh, approaches to fraud uh, within within China that you see? Uh, on online fraud or general fraud? I mean, uh, it really depends. Uh, it's very hard to say, I mean, uh, <laughs> but of course, uh, definitely with the, with the technology, right? With the big data technology that they have, with the AI technology that they have, right? So it's much easier to, to, to pinpoint, right? Or to identify, you know, uh, 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 criminal activities that uh, take place. So, you know, like, so as I said, I'm not very familiar whether yeah. this is happening in other places, but uh, in China, right? You know, it's quite CCTV is everywhere, mm -hmm. so 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 you record uh, uh, your 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 data, right? So even if you're conversing on the phone, sometimes you 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 opt in, right? You allow them to record, right? What you're talking to 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 uh, people and so on, and so it's it's quite easy for them to to trace back if something uh goes wrong. Right, uh, uh, over here compared to in a lot of places. That's why I give an example, right, of people that they've been trying to uh, catch for years, you know, criminals or, or who have been on hideout for years. And they, they may be hiding, but as soon as they go out, the, the camera, right, the CCTV captures them, and within 10 minutes, police are there waiting for them. So I think uh, with AI technology, with 5G, you know, uh, with big data, it is definitely much... Uh, uh, easier uh, for them to uh, do this. But of course, I must, I must confess I'm not an expert in this area. So I'm just making an educated guess that uh, it is happening. Yeah. So um, 
Professor Allen, I think, you know, from my perspective, you know, this has been, uh, I, I've learned a lot. Um, unfortunately, I've got to uh, excuse myself slightly early. There are a number of other questions here. Uh, I'm going to call on, um, you know, Chris Rudd, um, you know, who, who actually invited me to, to speak today um, to open the session for you to take over some of the Q&A because I unfortunately do have to run to another meeting. Um, but Professor Allen, it's been great today. I'll, I'll hand over to you, Chris, to, um, to complete some of the Q&A. But um, thank you very much um, for, for your presentation today, Professor. And I'll let Chris finish off. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Christopher, many thanks thank uh, for being uh, such a gracious host. Um, <clears throat> Alan, I'm really, really glad uh, uh, that we could make this happen. It's been a really uh, exciting, uh, insightful uh, 50 minutes or so. There's just a couple of questions left. That if you, if you're not dashing off for uh, for your evening jog, uh, <laughs> I'll run by you. Um, do you. Do you want to say something about the sort of um, the data privacy stuff? Because um, a lot of the the kind of pictures that you paint, I think, would would be rather kind of worrisome to yeah. um, a, a, you know a, a fully Western audience. I think you know you. Yeah. You're, you're talking to people mostly in Singapore, so we kind of face both ways. Um, yeah. You know, how do you feel about that as, as somebody who has come into China in the past, what, uh, I'm guessing, dozen years? And you know, are you are you completely inured to it? Or do you sometimes still shudder a little bit when you think about the extent of the the you know the Alan Chong data that's sitting somewhere on a <laughs> server in in yeah. Hangzhou. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, when I first came here, right, and compared to now, uh, in terms of uh, what I would have provide to people in terms of the data when I first came to China would be very different, right? But of course, uh, the reason why we are more willing to give in data over here in China is because of the convenience, right? In exchange for convenience, then at some time, at some point, you sort of need to, to provide the data. So as an example, like uh, WeChat payment, right? In the beginning, when we first came here, we don't really need to provide a lot of data. So we give them name, we give them our, our bank account, and sort of it works. And then at some point, they sort of... Uh, sort of suspend our account if we don't provide our a picture of our passport, we don't take a picture of our of our face, right? And then upload to the system. And because ha not having WeChat pay, Chris, as you know, <laughs> after, you know, it will be so, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how would you put it. It will be really inconvenient. I mean, this may sound crazy, right? I, I know someone from uh, a Chinese who spent years in the US. So, uh, he no longer has a, 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 a Chinese, uh, so he has a Chi he still holds his Chinese citizenship, but he doesn't have a Chinese ID because he spent like I don't know twenty years in, in the U.S. So whenever he comes back to uh, China during the summer, and he said it's very inconvenient, mainly because he can't he can't get a he can't get a, a, a taxi, right? He can so he dare not to, when his friend invite him out for dinner. He's very concerned because he can't get back home because <laughs> he can't get DD to go home because he doesn't have Alipay. <laughs> right? Because with Alipay, you need to have Chinese uh, ID. Then I realized that's how inconvenient it is for people without you know, uh, Alipay. So uh, it is quite, it's, a, it's a risk, uh, although uh, I was assured by a lot of uh, uh, people that they have policy in place, you know, data protection and so on. But uh, it depends on uh, how much are we willing to uh, sacrifice or, or to give in in exchange for uh, convenience. So yeah, it's a personal choice. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks, thanks for that, Alan. Um, I'm just watching the clock, so I think I'm going to make this the last question. Um, and, sure. and it's really, you know, so one of the reasons why this world that you've described to us is is so futuristic and 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 interesting is because not many of those apps that you've talked about make it outside China. And, and there are a few, you know, there's a few exceptions, obviously, like, like uh, TikTok and, uh, and Alipay, but really the penetration beyond, beyond PRC yeah. is, is, is pretty small, I, I would, I would yeah. gauge. Um, yeah. and, and I just, you know, look to get your comments on that. I know that, you know, that obviously the domestic market's huge and obviously it was a big 
factor in the 13th five-year plan to open up yeah. the uh, you know e- e-commerce uh, space to a lot of unconnected citizens in in West China. So there is there is surely a lot of uh, domestic growth, but but why do you think that we know so little about it beyond beyond the boundaries of PRC? Yeah. So. One thing that I mean it's quite interesting. I mean, I just talked to uh, some people in uh, in in Singapore. Uh, I think just a week ago, and they actually mentioned that uh, one of the reasons why is because people perceive uh, Chinese products in general, including then it comes to the apps as well, has been uh, inferior quality, right? Or the quality may not be as good as uh, uh, products from other countries. So with this perception, when you hear about certain apps, that our e-commerce our website from uh, uh, from China. Sometimes they associate it with not being a very innovative or cutting edge uh, technology, right? Rather, it could be because of our low quality. So it's an image. I think it's an image and branding uh, problem that a lot of these uh, Chinese uh, e-commerce companies are facing. So when you know, I talk to I mean uh, 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 people in Singapore, for example, in, in Malaysia, we use a lot of uh, WhatsApp. And when you ask them, how about WeChat? Why don't you use WeChat? They say, well, WeChat is quite similar to uh, WhatsApp. It's just a sort of copycat of uh, uh, WhatsApp. But for users in, in China, they would have a different view about WeChat because it's really a super app, right? That contains a lot of uh, mini uh, program and so on. So I think it's a branding issue, uh, perception issue that uh, this Chinese tech firm needs to uh, work on before people start accepting the products. Just like a lot of our traditional brands, right? Chinese uh, brand like Chinese cars, Chinese electronic appliances in the past, or what Korean companies used to face as well, right? People say, oh, Korean electronic appliances, maybe uh, they are cheaper, but not so good quality. But over time, right, the brand uh, uh, perception uh, change. So I think this is what Chinese uh, tech firm needs to uh, work on. Yeah. Alan, Alan, that's been a, a really great discussion. And I think that you will have lit a lot of kind of bushfires out there in terms of people's intellectual curiosity about this. The, the reason that we uh, asked, asked Alan to, to contribute to this lecture series was to sort of big up a little bit the fact that we are lo- lo- in the process of launching a whole bunch of new industry 4.0 programs, including data science, IoT, cybersecurity, and so on. And so in terms of uh, hitting that particular target, Alan, you know, you've really been right. I was going to say right on the money. I should say right on the Bitcoin, perhaps, in, in the current <laughs> context. So, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and, you know, I know that under normal circumstances, you are a very regular visit to Singapore. So I, I hope that we can actually get you in and, and do some of this um you know, in a face-to-face sense yeah. uh, in the not too distant future and to express our gratitude for your, uh, you know, your time and your, your friendship. So, so thanks for that. Um, before we close, you, could I ask people to go to the satisfaction poll that's just appeared on your screen and a, a big uh, vote of thanks for, for Alan. Many people have asked about the possibility to, to contact you and uh, with, with follow-up questions oh, yeah. and I know that because of your uh, generous nature that I'm sure that you would be happy to be contacted at alan.chong at nottingham.ed.cn um, and with that I'm going to wish everybody a great evening and thank Alan once again for a really Thank you, inspiring Chris. session. Thanks Alan and hope to see you in the flesh very yeah. soon.